ahead and get started for today. Um, thank you to everybody for coming out today. Um, so I have, it, it really gives me a lot of uh, a lot of pleasure today to be able to introduce uh, somebody who was really important in my own career development um, as my postdoc advisor. Uh, so Gordon Lithgow is going to be our speaker today. Uh, so he grew up in Scotland in the Glasgow area, um, got his PhD at the University of Glasgow, um, and then uh, took a kind of brief two-year uh, postdoc in, in pharmaceutical uh, research in Switzerland, and then got bitten by the aging bug and decided to move to Colorado and join Tom Johnson's lab. And during his time in Tom Johnson's lab, he had a number of really high-impact publications in science, PNAS, other uh, journals, and among those, one of the really exciting discoveries he made uh, was that there was an intimate connection between longevity and the heat shock response. And I think this, this finding is not only interesting on its own, own right, but also makes this connection between stress response pathways and how those contribute, how uh, environmental stresses can contribute to the aging process and environmental response pathways can help combat those environmental exposures and also internal stresses that may drive the aging process. Um, after his time in Tom's lab, he then had ran his own lab in Manchester for a number of years, um, and then was recruited to join the Buck Institute right as it was being founded. And I was uh, probably your first U.S. Um, recruit that you had in your lab. You had a number of people that came with you from Manchester, but I think I was the first uh, U.S. person uh, in your lab. Um, and while, while at the Buck, he's also continued to do really innovative research, um, with one of the exciting things being the, the concept of, of using nematodes as a drug screening platform. Um, and with that, he really did, uh, he and Kerry Cornfield did a great deal of uh, groundbreaking research with now starting to use nematodes and other simple organisms as a drug screening platform. Um, and now that's has led to the founding of a NIH-funded interventions testing program that for, focuses on the use of nematodes as a screening model. Um, and that's the, what he's going to talk to us about today. Um, so thank you so much for coming, Gordon. It was good to see you. Thank you, Al. Thank you. Craig Davis, Mr. Gutton. Thank you. I've forgotten half of that stuff. Um, so I'm going to talk about interventions in aging, and uh, I'm going to start with a very general introduction. It's really a two-parter. I want to talk about some of our, our lab's research into compounds that promote protein homeostasis and how they may be interesting, how proteostasis itself may be an interesting target for aging interventions. And then I'm going to talk about... Um, ah, lights. That one. Then I'm going to talk about the Serenodactis Intervention Testing Program, which is a multi-site program uh, which mirrors some aspects of the interventional testing program that's been conducted on mice over the last few years. So uh, hopefully some of that will be of interest to you. Um, let's just start with this question. How are we going to know when we've got the answer to the problem of aging? And I don't really know, but I think we'll be able to explain two things. I think we'll be able to explain why very different species live very different times, life lifespans. I mean, all of these animals essentially composed of the same materials, lipids, proteins, carbohydrates, nucleic acids, but living radically different lifespans as a result of evolutionary pressures. I think we'll know the answer to that. And we'll probably know the answer to why aging is a common risk factor for a constellation of very different kinds of diseases. Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, adult cancers. There's a spelling mistake up here. Don't, don't find it. Uh, sarcopenia, diabetes. Why is it that aging is a common risk factor? Is there a mechanistic basis to that? And can we understand that mechanistic basis? If we can understand that, then there's potentially the opportunity to develop interventions in aging mechanisms that affect not just one disease state, but many. And that's essentially, I think, a, a very general hypothesis that the entire biology of aging field is testing right now, this idea of aging as a central cause to multiple disease pathologies, and the, the great promise that that might hold for interventions here. So what, part of what we do in my lab is essentially look for chemical compounds that alter aging phenotypes. Um, and we do that not for the great glory of, you know, potentially making a difference in all these diseases, but really just to uncover new biology. That's the primary purpose of the screens. But of course, once you have these compounds, you have the opportunity to potentially move these into different systems and into different disease models and into mice 
and eventually into preclinical work and clinical work. So behind all of this activity, and many, many labs are doing this, conducting screens and worms and flies and yeast and so on, I think is the possibility that out of this activity will come lead compounds for interventions. So first of all, I'm going to talk about a target for intervention, proteostasis, and then the CITP. Protein homeostasis. Um, as Al said, we, you know, we discovered way back when that long-lived mutants were resistant to heat stress, and that made us think about the role of molecular chaperones and the role of unfolded proteins in aging. And uh, what, of course, we're talking about is all the mechanisms that try and promote pathways towards native protein and appropriate degradation, and, uh, and also prevent aggregation pathways, or going down aggregation pathways, with the possibility of producing um, toxic molecules, and, of course, autophagy and the removal of these things once they actually happen. So that, we're talking about very different types of biology, very different molecular machines involved in protein homeostasis. But it seems like this is important for normal longevity. And many, 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 and I'm talking about scores and scores of papers in model organisms, have led to almost the acceptance of the importance of protein homeostatic mechanisms in lifespan extension especially. So where you have mutations that extend lifespan and signaling pathways and other pathways, you tend to require aspects of protein homeostasis, autophagy being a really good example of that. So the genetics has been saying for years that this is all important, but we've lacked biochemistry. And what we really lack is the wealth of knowledge that the neuroscientists have developed around neurotoxic peptides. So all the myriad of different forms that amyloid can be processed into and, and, and take up conformationally and the resultant either disease states or non-disease states that result. So in a way, what we've been trying to do in recent years is make a connection between this literature, very specific to specific disease states, and the wider issue of protein homeostasis and aging. So I'll talk about how we got into that biochemically, first of all, and then we'll get back to compounds after that. So the central question for a few of us in the lab a few years ago was, okay, protein homeostasis is important, you overexpress chaperones, you live longer, you knock down autophagy, you don't live as long, all, it's all important. But what is it they're dealing with? What are the client proteins, if you like? What are the proteins that are important either to degrade or to, to form into aggregates or not form into aggregates? What's the substrate for the protein homeostatic machinery that's so important in longevity? And so we decided to go at this by asking the question, are neurotoxic peptides exceptional? I mean, they are exceptional in the sense that A-beta and alpha synuclein cause catastrophic disease, but are they exceptional biochemically? And Pedro Rodriguez, a PhD student, took on this problem. And this was all conducted in this, the worm scene of Dietis elegans. Um, of course, I, I don't need to introduce this as an aging system. It's a wonderful system. There's 25 years of genetics, for the most part, in understanding longevity in this organism. And we would grow up large populations, synchronously aging populations of this organism, and start doing biochemistry. And we were influenced by a collaborator, Bob Hughes at the Buck Institute, who worked on Huntington. And, and Bob suggested a protocol that we try on these populations of, of C. elegans worms. And the protocol was what you would do if you were trying to extract Huntington from a diseased brain. And that is to make a, a protein extract, cell lysate, spin down, and then wash the pellet with a detergent, in this case SDS. So what you're left with at the end here is an SDS insoluble fraction of cell material. We would then re-solubilize that in a strong acid and analyze in various ways. And so this is what Pedro started to see, and maybe just confine your attention to this half here, or this third. He would grow up the worms to the first day of adulthood, make a, an insoluble protein prep, I some, we sometimes say insoluble ohm. We all hate that word, but we use it, unfortunately. Um, so he would make an insoluble protein prep, and he'd run it on SDS gel, and he'd see a few bands. Then he would grow up a population to midlife, 11 days. The worms live anywhere from 18 to 20 days. And you see now that there's an accumulation of additional polypeptides and proteins which are behaving like Huntington would behave. They're coming down in the insoluble fraction of the protein extract. So it's an age-related accumulation in insoluble proteins. Um, we're fortunate that we've got a great protein chemistry core, an innovative core with Brad Gibson and Birgit Schilling at the Buck. 
And we presented this to them, and they, they said, yes, this is, sounds interesting. Let's get in there and find out what this material is. And the proteins that they identified represented a wide range of classes of proteins with a wide range of functions. They also represented proteins that were predicted to be expressed in different tissues and in different organelles. So really, this is a proteome-wide phenotype we're looking at. It was enriched for certain things, though. There was uh, strong enrichment for ribosomal functions, uh, translation functions in general, and an enrichment for mitochondrial functions and a few others. But what really struck us was how universal this was. This wasn't a couple of proteins coming down. This was proteins from right across the proteome. Absolutely. Um, Cynthia Kenyon's lab published an account, almost an identical account to this, um, as, we were, as we were working on the manuscript, and we were really uh, pleased to see that the, it was entirely consistent. They were saying the same classes of proteins coming down using a similar methodology. So, of course, the, the question was, is, is this important? We might have predicted that we would see this loss of protein homeostasis with age, but did it mean anything? And in the background, of course, there's this discussion about the, the, whether aggregates are beneficial or detrimental in different disease states. So it could be this material that we're seeing on the gel is actually beneficial for the worm or in some ways represents some detrimental events. So what Pedro decided to do next was, it's really an odd experiment looking back. Um, he decided to take individual proteins that appear in the insoluble ohm and drop the abundance of those proteins by RNA interference. Individual proteins. And when he did that, he saw that this list of proteins was enriched for proteins that determined lifespan. So it's classic survival curve here, age and days, percent survivals, controls, and then here's some of the uh, translational functions here, all extending lifespan. He did this for 100 proteins and 43 protein RNAIs extended lifespan. This was a big enrichment. We also did a random set, ensured it was a big enrichment. Big enrichment for proteins that determine normal longevity in the worm just by going to those proteins that accumulate as insoluble entities in midlife in this case. So we come away from that thinking, OK, there's a body of genetics saying protein homeostasis is important. And what we're adding to this is a, a sort of biochemical view of this, a biochemical phenotype that, yes, Proteins do become insoluble during normal aging, and actually those proteins are enriched for things that determine lifespan. But it's very confusing, and um, I, I don't know, we've thought about various models, but it's very confusing as to why the reduction of a single protein in a great mixture of different kinds of proteins, why a reduction of that single protein should result in a phenotype at all, in this case, lifespan extension. I'll I'm not going to provide an answer to that because we don't have it yet, but it's the kind of thing that we think about and worry about. So part of what we've been doing since then is thinking about different ways to modulate the rate of accumulation of insoluble protein. We would like genetic um, modifiers of the, this molecular phenotype, and um, we would like to be able to do this with small molecules as well. And I'm going to talk about a couple of examples. Oh, sorry, first of all, before I do that, we thought about, can we accelerate the rate of protein insolubility? What kind of things could we do? You know, stress the animals in some ways. And sure enough, if you expose the animals to heat, not surprisingly, proteins are becoming unfolded. They end up in the insoluble ohm. Uh, but this was an interesting one. We also exposed the worms to dietary iron. So we took the worms out to about six days of age, so it's still quite young, exposed them to iron for a couple of days, and make insoluble protein preps. And sure enough, Ida, the PhD student doing this. This is the control in this case. We're getting better and better at making these things. And now if you've been fed dietary iron, you see an increase in the accumulation of the insoluble protein. Possibly not surprising. And we expected to go in there and find all sorts of new proteins that were subject to some redox modifications and so on. But in general, we didn't. What we found was that the original proteins that would normally expand during normal aging were turning up in these quite young animals exposed to iron. So the iron essentially was accelerating this, this aging phenotype. 
And I mean, it's mainly based on GoTerms here, but a lot of the same proteins are coming through. So it's an acceleration of, of, of the insoluble protein accumulation. And, I, and of course, as you might expect, these animals live shorter as well. So I don't know what that means, but it, it told us that we could modify the rate of accumulation and it, and it correlated to lifespan, at least in this case. Of course, what you want to do is go the other way. And that's what the meat of the next 15 minutes is going to be. Looking for chemical compounds that promote protein homeostasis. Um, there's different ways of doing this in the worm. Um, we, we are indebted to Chris Link and Rick Morimoto, both of whom developed models, early models of protein aggregation in the worm. And generally, what you, you see here is the expression of uh, neurotoxic peptides in the worm in different tissues. Um, amazingly, for many of those experiments, what happens is there's some sort of degenerative process and the worms become paralyzed. And so you get this beautiful and obvious phenotype that correlates to protein aggregation processes. I should have said that when you express these, you also see the formation of large aggregates in the tissues you express them in. This would be um, poly-Q protein, for example, alpha-synuclein, A-beta. So that's one set of models that we've exploited. A second set was uh, really teased out by Rick Morimoto, who said, look, there's a lot of temperature-sensitive mutations that we would predict when you put a worm in a restrictive temperature, proteins are going to unfold. And maybe they end up as, as aggregates or, or some sort of altered form. And so there's a whole panel of mutant, uh, mutants that we use where, again, lots of different phenotypes, but paralysis is one that we use frequently that represent uh, protein, uh, protein misfolding processes going on in the worm. So with one of these models, Carl Lamarck, postdoc in the lab, set out to do a screen for compounds that prevented paralysis, paralysis caused by the expression of A-beta. Turn on the expression after a number of days, there's some sort of process, large aggregates form, and the worms become paralyzed. So very easy screen. So you just come in there, the chemical library, in this case it was a natural product library, and she identified, versus the viewer control here, that vitamin D3 suppressed this phenotype. And I'm going to use this as an example, partly because I couldn't believe that we could find anything interesting about vitamin D3. I mean, there's a, a paper every five minutes on this. Um, but it, it, it did make the connection to potentially the big debate about vitamin D supplementation and everything that was going on in that, in that clinical domain. So the more we read, the more we thought this might be worth working on. So, as you know, although I didn't know it at the time, I had to remind myself that uh, we make vitamin D by two, two hydroxylation steps in the liver and the kidney from D3. Um, what happens in the skin is 7D hydrocholesterol is converted to D3, and then we see the production of the active 125 dihydroxyvitamin D3 ligand, the active ligand for vitamin D3 vitamin D receptor. And so the first question was, well, we were feeding worms this stuff here. And the question was, was there any evidence at all of conservation of metabolism? And we went to Arvind Ranamathan, metabolomics expert, the buck. And we did a couple of things. First of all, we made lipid extracts from worms fed D3 or not fed D3. And it turns out that if you feed worms D3, the lipid extracts you make from those worms will turn on a human vitamin D receptor in a cell-based model. That's just a little luciferase assay. So worms were making something that would turn on uh, a human vitamin D receptor. And we suspect it was 125, and Arvind was able to show that these are control worms in red, but worms fed D3 produced a nice healthy amount of active 125 dihydroxy um, ligand. So, so the, there appears to be some evidence for um, metabolism being conserved between the worm and mammals. Then we went, got back to the proteome and the insoluble -ome. So the comparison now is this lane here, day eight animals, grown under normal control conditions. And these animals here that have been exposed to D3. And there's a huge suppression of the formation of the insoluble -ome. These animals are accumulating insoluble proteins at a much lower rate. And we quantified all this, of course, and, 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 and documented this in various ways. So this was the point where you say, maybe there's something interesting here that you've got vitamin D, and you go to the literature and you look for examples of vitamin D affecting 
proteome uh, you know, insolubility or um, plaque models, and there's very little there. There was, there was certainly one paper showing that DC treatment in an amyloid um, mouse was, was able to reduce plaque formation. That was essentially it. So we just took this a bit further because we thought this is potentially interesting. Um, the prediction was that D3 would extend lifespan, which it does. And then we go back to this literature and we say, okay, so if you're vitamin D deficient, then you're at risk for multiple chronic diseases. Uh, rickets, of course, in children, but all of these in adults. And, of course, this is uh, epidemiological studies for the most part, and, and cause and effect is really not clear here. But if you're deficient, you're at risk. Yeah. Yeah. Is there any evidence that has a Right, great question. So um, the concentrations I, I can't I can't think of them if they're on the slide, but um, I think they are on the slide actually for the lifespan curves. Yeah. Um, the concentrations appear really high, micromolar rate range. However, the the one twenty five ligand or potential ligand that's made by the worm is very much in the physiological range. And then yeah, we haven't, we, we haven't looked for other metabolites. And you're absolutely right. I mean, if we, if we are pushing a lot of D3 through a very complex metabolic system for these steroids, chances are we're producing other things as well. And, and that's one of the, the, our major limitations at the moment. We know we're making 125. We know that we're making something that can activate human VDR. But we don't know if that's the, the active ligand in the worm that's giving us the phenotypes. That's a supposition at this point. And is there any evidence that that? Oh, not that I know of. I'm sure there's many people in the room know more about D3, vitamin D than I do. But. And then one last question. Hmm? Uh, have you uh, just drawn the D3 on the DNA of the worm? It's, it's absolutely skin one dependent. Um, but. I'll, I'll get to it. I'll get to it. Yeah. So, so worms in the lab, we think are deficient in D3. So there's no sign of ligand when we make preps from these worms, but we suspect they could make it if they were if they were subjected to sunlight. So that's the real question right now: is that is every experiment that's been done on C. elegans for the past X number of years, 60 years, being done on D3 deficient worms. It's possible. They probably do get exposed to sunlight. They, I mean, they used to be called soil dwelling, but really they're, they're rotten fruit dwelling. So they're there. They, they do have a negative light behavior, but um, I don't know. I, I suspect that they have opportunities to be exposed. Um, it's gone. I was going to make another point there, but it's gone. I have a question related to the hand. Yeah. So if you see the, the long, long lived mutant oh. with the D3, the D3, and is there any the, the mutant the strain there which don't show the additive or the pattern extension of the lifespan? That's related to Right. I'm sorry. Yes. Yeah, so if you feed, um, you, can, you can get lifespan extension on DAF2 mutants, for example, that are long lived already. Um, We've looked at a number of other mutants. We've looked at germline mutants. We've looked at DAF16 insulin signaling pathway mutants, and it's not connected to that. But I'll show you what I think it is connected. So this is the great thing about the worm. You know, you combine the, the compound treatment with the genetics, the, great, the, you know, the richness of the genetics that's there, and hopefully you can get down to some sort of pathway or mechanism quite quickly. Anyway, I was just going to put out the possibly silly hypothesis that we were thinking about, which is that essentially um, vitamin D deficiency, there's a lot of diseases up here that are chronic aging diseases. And we're wondering if the, the worms that are deficient in the lab clearly have an accelerated aging process, at least in terms of uh, insoluble protein and, and lifespan. Could people who are deficient have ex essentially be in an accelerated aging phenotype?
And of course, I have no data on that. Um, mechanism. So we, we did what I said. We, we tried lots of different mutants. And I won't bore you with all the data, but I just want to say that what, the first thing we came across was there was a complete dependence on IRE1, XBP1 signaling in the ERUPR. Complete dependence. So it looks a bit like, I think we've got some data here. So here's the controls are now in black. And if you knock down XPP1 and you treat with vitamin D, you can see that you don't see a lifespan extension. If anything, it's a lifespan collapse, or at least a shortening. So that, that's the kind of data, along with the paralysis data on the aggregation models. So it's quite a, quite a data panel saying it requires XPP1 and uh, IRE1. It doesn't require the other signaling arms of the ERUPR. So what's going on? Um, we did an RNA-seq experiment because we wanted to document the IRE1, you know, uh, sorry, the ERUPR would be activated in these worms, obviously, that was the hypothesis, um, in an XPP1-dependent manner, and that would be a great connection to protein homeostatic machinery, and that would be the punchline of the paper. There was no activation at all of the ERUPR upon D3 feeding. So the ERUPR was not induced, at least at the time points that we've looked at. What was induced was a huge signal of the NERF2 transcription factor. So this is an oxidative stress tra responsive transcription factor in the worm, the homolo homologous skin one. And we thought, well, that's odd. We've, we're missing our ERUPR, but here's this big skin one signal here. Can we explain it? And, and the only way we can explain it right now is one paper from Keith Blackwell's lab uh, a couple of years ago now. And the paper essentially links skin one to the ERUPR. And it does, show, but it does so by showing an interdependency. So you don't get a full ERUPR if, you're, if you don't have skin one and vice versa. So we tried skin one. Um, here's the vitamin D lifespan extension in this case, pretty modest. But here's the skin one here. So there's no lifespan extension in the skin one background. So the hypothesis right now is that we're probably missing the ERUPR. That's one possibility. But also that the full effect of a skin one response requires XBP1. So if the benefits are coming from a skin one inductive response, then you better have XBP1 around. And so if we take it away, the effects go away. That's our best guess at hypothesis at the moment. OK, so I just want to summarize vitamin D. There's some evidence of conserved metabolism. It seems to prevent widespread protein insolubility, extends lifespan, and is acting through some sort of network, perhaps. I mean, network's the wrong word, but some sort of interaction between these transcription factors. Yeah, we did do those experiments, and I think because we now know that vitamin D doesn't induce the ER, it, was, it looked complicated at the time, we couldn't interpret the data, but I think it's just because it's, it's inert to the ERUPR, so it doesn't have an interaction with it. Again, at the time points we've looked at. Someday, hopefully, I won't have to say that. Okay, so this is an example, it's just one, we've got about 20 or 30 compounds that seem to behave in this way. They either prevent the widespread protein insolubility, or we've got data on these compounds in these aggregation models, A, beta, and so on. And this was just one I thought would be worth showing as an example, but we have others. And so the question that we've got at the moment is whether some of these things can be translated. Now, vitamin D, of course, is subject to multiple clinical trials, and that's out of our domain, and that's great, but hopefully we can at least enter the conversation and suggest that aging could be an important feature that people should be thinking about in vitamin D trials. But I'm going to mention very quick, and I'm really going to go quickly because I want to get to CITP, very quickly an example of how we're trying to translate some things at the Buck Institute. And this is published um, that a number of years ago, Silvestri Alaves in our lab found a number of amyloid binding dyes, so used to visualize amyloid and histochemical staining. And these binding dyes, he thought, might be useful to prevent protein aggregation. And he was able to show that. I don't think I need to dim the lights. These are large A-beta aggregates forming in muscle. But if he grew the worms in thioflavin T, for example, you just see a soluble signal here. And when he did that, he predicted that if you put these on normal worms, they would increase lifespan. And that's what they did. 
So in a dose response, you see the sweet spot here with thioflavin T at high concentrations that reduces lifespan. So we thought that maybe not thioflavin T itself would be good for translation, but some of the more drug-like molecules that exist uh, that are designed around thioflavin T. Now, a group in Barcelona designed these compounds, which all contain a metal binding pocket. So they don't just interact with amyloid, they also collate metals that might be associated with amyloid. And these also extend lifespan in the worm, but at much lower concentrations than thioflavin T. And this is a compound that we've taken forward into a mouse study that was conducted mainly by Simon Melov at the Buck Institute, a late life intervention study, where we enrolled 700 mice in the study. We looked at four different compounds, HPX being one of them. And we did regular assessments of functional metrics, cardiovascular function, metabolism, um, bone health. And this, the question was, were any of these um, compounds acting like rapamycin, in fact, rapamycin, and Simon previously showed, protected against cardiac dis car heart dysfunction. And I'm not going to show you the data, but this is a, a scan uh, of a live mouse. And it just represents the, one of the major results that's emerging. And it would be great if you could get Simon out here to talk about this. I think it would be really interesting in relation to the ITP. Um, what we're seeing so far is that the HPX is preventing bone loss in the mouse. And we're, I just, that tickles me, the fact that you screen for compounds in an invertebrate and you find something that's protecting against bone loss. But that's what you might predict, of course, if, if the mechanism you're hitting is a conserved aging mechanism. If the bone loss is connected to aging and the proteostasis is connected to aging, then you might predict that something like this might come out. So we're still to analyze the data on heart function, um, metabolism, and so on. But so HBX is kind of interesting. Um, early in the study, at the 50th percentile, there was a beneficial effect on mortality, although that went away, so it wasn't significant in the end. But there's clear prevention of bone loss. And there's also indications of improvements in neurological disease models. Holly Van Remen's unpublished work in ALS, and Julie Anderson's unpublished work in Parkinson's disease. So this is, I think, all we can do at this point. We, we're getting these molecules out of the worm and getting them into some disease models, encouraging our colleagues to pick them up, and occasionally setting up an aging study like Simon did. So I'm not going to talk any more about the mice for now. As I say, it's something that Simon would be, would be great to hear him talk about. Yeah. It's stronger in female, I believe, but it's significant for both. Yeah. Okay. Okay, cool. Uh, well, one question for you. So, uh, you had a point when you screened that they could. Yeah. Did that, did, that, did that also come out as a uh, uh, A-beta? Yes. Binding? Yes, it does. So, it prevents, so it, it, it dyes amyloid in tissues. Um, it, it also came out as suppressing A beta aggregation in the worm and also extends lifespan. Ah, that's a really good example because it, we'll come back to whether it extends lifespan or not. Well, did you see, uh, you know, you must be familiar with that J147 Oh, right. Okay. Huh. I didn't know that was derived from curcumin. Is it much smaller? Yeah, okay, great. Thank you. Um, okay, so big change in topic, but not really. You'll see in the end. Um, it hasn't escaped your notice, I presume, that every week or every month in one nature magazine or another, someone's writing an article about the fact that the biomedical community is failing to reproduce its own data. Um, I've talked to people who say this is a non-issue, and they have good reasons for saying that, that the companies, for example, that have tried to undertake studies done in academia, don't know what they're doing, don't take enough care to replicate protocols, don't spend enough time working on the experiments to make them work. Um, but it's serious because if the numbers being talked about, and we're talking about billions of dollars, are even remotely close, it's a very serious problem that we are creating a literature containing over half, 60, 70% of which is not going to replicate. Um, we have our own dirty little secret in this area. 
so we should use our own example. So way back in 2000, we were, Simon and I were getting interested in compounds for the first time. And we published a paper in Science uh, showing that these catalytic mimetics extended lifespan. That was the extent of the paper. Um, there was some fertility data in there, but really we just said these compounds extend lifespan and this was greeted with a huge fanfare, media circus and all the rest of it because it was received inaccurately, I should say, as the first example of a drug-like molecule extending lifespan. Um, it certainly was the first paper probably in a major journal on this subject, but it, it just was a ridiculous response to what we'd actually done. David Gems, a good friend and colleague who I was at graduate school with, called me up and asked for the compounds, and we sent them the compounds. They wanted to use them to test the hypothesis. And David calls me six months later and says, it's not working. They're not long-lived. And so we compared notes, compared methodologies. They had to change their strain. They had to do some things. Um, and they ran the experiments again, and they didn't work. And they never worked. They never could get these compounds to extend lifespan in their lab in London. And eventually David said, look, my student has to graduate, we're going to publish. And so this is now two years after the original publication in an aging journal, they published the fact that they don't work. I should say the compounds still worked in our hands in our lab, but we couldn't tell David what to do to get them to work in his lab only you know, 400 miles to the south of us. This pattern has repeated itself over the years. Uh, Michael Petrocek's paper on antidepressant. I'm just sticking to the, the C. elegans examples for the most part. You can fill in the others that are currently going on. Um, Michael publishes this great paper in Nature, really nice chemical screen, 88,000 compounds, gets some nice hits. Um, fairly quickly, Risto's lab in Germany publishes, with some changes in methodology, to be fair, but publishes that they don't work in their hands. Finally, we don't even need to talk about resveratrol and the controversy around that. Um, again, David James in London saying that resveratrol has no effect on lifespan in Drosophila and C. elegans. Um, this is bad. This is really bad. I mean, I don't know, remember the resveratrol issue of nature where there was eight pages of paper and counter papers going back and forward on this? This is on top of the original papers that said yes and no. So this is, it's a really good example in, in our own field of potentially a situation that's widespread in biomedical literature. So I don't know when it happened, Randy, but at some point, someone at NIA, probably listening to you guys, said, this is a problem. We should do something about that. And I don't know what the history of that is. You can tell us if you want. But back in 2003, when was, IT, when was ITP set up? Uh, 2003. Yeah. And I think you all know this, in 2003, the NIA said, you know, we, we see trouble here. There's people not being able to replicate results. We should set up a system where results are replicated, where there's experiments undertaken as best we can in an identical fashion at multiple sites. And this is one of them. And the program has been an incredible success, of course, and um, raised the bar in a number of ways. Oh, there it is. Four. Um, for rodent aging experiments and, and created some of the most dramatic findings with rapamycin, for example. So, again, I don't know how it happened, but sometime in 2011 or so, the NIA started to think about the program and think how they could deliver additional compounds to the program and also maybe address some of the other issues that could be addressed. And for some reason, they went to Cinerobditis, and of course, I'm eternally grateful for them for that, partly perhaps because there was these high-profile papers that were being that were not being replicated in the literature. But also, I think, because they were interested in genetics and they were interested in genetic diversity. And it turns out that Cerebditis is a great place to look for that. So we were fortunate enough to be one of three sites funded to conduct this, this program. Patrick Phillips in Oregon, Monica Driscoll at Rutgers. And essentially, we set out these goals, standardized protocols. That's a year and a half of phone calls and emails that I will not tell you about. It's horrible. It's unbelievable how different two people doing a simple lifespan experiment with C. elegans can be. It's so a year and a half of standardizing protocols. Uh, and then we were going to look for robust chemical lifespan extension across multiple labs. And then we also wanted to look in very different genetic backgrounds. So it's the general goals. 
So Patrick Phillips is an expert in, in Cynorhabditis and various species and strains. And so he went to the wild strain collection. This is an ever-increasing strain collection of sequenced genomes. And he picked out strains in Cynorhabditis that were highly divergent from each other. And he did the same for two other species, Briggsy and Tropicalis. And these strains come from all over the world. They're mainly collected by Anne-Marie Felix. So this is like a chart of where she vacations around the world. Uh, different colors just represent the different species here. Mainly collected from rotting fruit. So you have genetic diversion, that divergence, you have geographic diversion, divergence. Um, and then we set out to do what at first seemed like an incredibly boring experiment, but we thought we have to do this just to see where we stand. And that was to all three labs, look at three species, 22 strains in total, and we said to Patrick, this is insane. Why are we looking at 20 strains? And he said, well, you can't, you can't say anything about a species just by looking at one or two strains. You have to look broadly. So we looked at, you know, six to eight strains for each species. Um, we did three biological replicates as normal, three technical replicates. This first experiment was 21,000 worms enrolled in the, in the initial assays. And we looked at development time, fertility, and lifespan just to see whether we're all on the same plate or not. The development time and fertility are very similar across all the strains. Yes? Uh, Jim. Are, the, are the strains genetically identical? The, the strains are genetically diverse. Uh, I, I mean, oh, within. I'm sorry, yes. They're, they're, they're all isogenic within. Um, probably. So there's some, yeah, yeah. We, we're fairly certain that they've gone enough generations in the lab that they're isogenic. So all the individual animals yeah, for any given strain are identical. Um, so development time and fertility, very similar. That's not true, I'm sorry. Development time, very similar. Fertility uh, was lower in tropicalis, and that's used to being growing in the tropics, and maybe it's just not at the optimal temperature. But the real interesting thing, of course, for us was lifespan. So I'm going to show some complicated slides, but I just want to, partly because it represents all the data, but also I'll, I'll focus in on what I think is interesting. But please feel free to, to wander and think about some of the other things you're seeing here. So this is just the baseline lifespan studies. So uh, Briggsy strains, Elegant strains, and Tropicalis. And there's some heterogeneity here, as you can see. And there's also heterogeneity within the groups. So we're seeing a, a high degree of variance. And you can look at that in another way. The top is all the lifespan curves for all the individual strains and species. And you can parse those lifespan cur curves into different bins of variability. And this is an analysis that was done by Patrick. Uh, the first thing you can say is generally, elegans is the shortest lived species in general. The other two species are longer lived. But there's also tremendous variation within a species. So this is Briggsy. And so you've got long lived Briggsy strains and short lived. But if you collapse all the survival curves from all the labs just down into single survival curves, the labs are the same. So there's no systematic difference between the labs. Um, we only achieved that when on one phone call someone said, wait a minute, you call the first day adults day one? We call the larvae day one. So, so, so there was a three-day difference for about six months because of that. Um, uh, we, <laughs> we, we now use the adult, first day of adult. Okay, so, so we were kind of happy that there was no systematic difference between the lab, and that meant the year and a half of looking at the protocols, thinking about how we would do things, um, really secured a sort of level playing field. Yes? Just because they'd asked you about the sex difference, so, so these are all... Um, Hermaphrodites. Non Hermaphrodites non-mated. You can see I'm hesitating. The, the reason is that we, we don't know, and we might come back to this, we don't know if there are males as larvae. The, the hermaphrodites that we pick, we pick off a plate, we pick l force. And it's possible that they've been exposed to males before then. So they're not mating, but they may have been exposed to males. OK. So on the face of it, a success, but not very interesting until we saw this it's a complicated slide but what you're looking at are essentially control experiments they're control curves these are non there's no drugs in here um, you're looking at a number of different strains and you're looking at all three experimental sites 
And we be began to see hints of this earlier on. It was really weird where you'd set up an experiment and you get worms that are quite short-lived. And you set up the same strain in the same lab under the same conditions. And suddenly it was really quite different. And the worm people in the room are probably going, yes, we see differences between survivals. You set them up one time, you get short, and next there's a little bit longer. But the degree of difference for some of these strains seemed to be quite extreme. And so we decided to do more than we intended to do and fill out this, this, this table. And as we filled it out, we started to see that there was lots of examples of strains in particular labs where the distribution of lifespan didn't seem to be normal. It was biphasic. You were either long-lived or short-lived. And it didn't matter what month you did the experiments. It didn't matter the lab. It didn't matter the technician or the, or the student or the postdoc that was doing the experiments. It just would be random. Is it long-lived or is it short-lived? And we've no idea what this is. We have absolutely no idea. We've never seen anything like this before with the N2 lab strain that we, we've all been working with. Although I even question that now. I wonder if we actually went and compiled a lot of N2 data, whether we begin to see something like this. I don't know. It's an open question. What's the distribution of lifespan for N2? But certainly for these strains, and now I can tell you these are all Briggs EA strains, for these strains, it's very clear there's something going on. And it's not all the time in all the labs, in all the strains, but there's a lot of examples of it across the three sites. So think about what we're trying to do. We're trying to set up a system where we test compounds and go out into the community and say, there we are, there's the definitive, you know, this is what resveratrol does in, for example, briggs -EA. But this opened up the, the question whether these animals are so physiologically different from these animals that they might give a different result in any given run with a compound. It's possible that you can never extend the lifespan of these short-lived worms, or sorry, or, or long-lived. I mean, you could have it any way around at all. You just might get a different result. And so this essentially is, a, is an added level of variance to what appear to be simple experiments that we had no idea existed. So I'd love to hear your ideas on what it might be. Did geography play a role? Geography does not play a role. And think about it, I mean, even, you know, so this was collected at a particular site, but it's the same worms, the identical strain from the identical frozen stock that is now long-lived as opposed to short-lived. Yeah? Uh, was it genetically confirmed? Like, after you get this result, can you confirm whether there's any mix-up or anything? Yeah, the, 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 the chances of mix-up is, is negligible. It's very, very difficult to imagine, partly because it's happening in all three labs and with, with different personnel setting things up. Um, you know, is there genetic diversity in here? I mean, again, it's like you, you, you pick 30 worms and they all behave in the short-lived fashion or the long-lived fashion. So it's difficult to see how genetics could be playing a part. Um, people have suggested we think about mitochondria and whether there's mitochondrial he heteroplasmy at play. And somehow we're selecting for one or the other form in the way that we set up the experiments under this protocol, which we think is quite strict. but. Yeah, no, we, we, ha we haven't yet. I mean, we definitely, RNA-seqs would be an obvious one. Sample the populations, let them run out their survival, find out which bin they're in, and then do RNA-seq. Um, so that's something I think we'll almost have to do. Since you mentioned males, I may as well mention what we think is going on. And it may be not as interesting as, yeah. The most robust findings seems to be in the JU-1264. Yes. No, I mean, temp temporarily. So was it, you know, in February they all set up? We've looked at that and it's not, it's not, it's not there's no temporal order to this. As, as we went along, we thought, what's happening here? You would randomly get one going one way and going the other. Um, so do you have the protocol set up? Do you have the grandmothers and the mothers growing and never halting? Correct. So we, we, we go from a frozen stock into a controlled protocol for three generations, and then we do the experiment. Never starved. Okay. Yeah, never starved. Passaged. Um, so one hypothesis is it's something to do with males. 
The, anecdotally, these strains are throwing more males than C. elegans does. If, if there are plates where males are being produced during development, we might not see that. It's hard to tell a male from a hermaphrodite during development. Um, and we pick L4s at the end. Well, I know we talked about it today. Um, we pick clear L4, larval stage 4 animals at the end, the hermaphrodites that we want to enroll in the experiment. And we think we might miss if there was males in those populations prior to that. So then the key finding from other labs, including Colleen Murphy's lab, is that the presence of males can shorten lifespan of hermaphrodites. So maybe exposure, even during development to a small number of males, could be generating these very diverse outcomes. Just a hypothesis, we don't know. But we've also thought, you know, you know is, is there any sign of this in, in the mouse literature? You know, if you, if you compiled replicates done across the ITP, is there any sign at all that the variation is not simply, you know, something different? Okay. Well, is, should it matter? I mean, again, yeah, these worms no, are identical no, to these worms. Yeah. Possible. Yeah. Yeah, it's possible. Hmm. I mean, Simon's done a survey, not not a, not a, not a, an analysis, but simply a survey of black six lifespans, and there's clearly lots of diversity. But whether it falls into particular modes or not, I don't know. Yeah, Jim. That's great to know. Yeah. That's interesting. And uh, Christian Pike uh -huh. now has data coming out, well, coming out. He's shown a number of things that in, uh, in humans, and also in his mice, I think, mice is stronger, that uh, in utero exposure to male hormone affects Alzheimer's. Right, right. That first observation is really interesting, just imagining the the embryos in the worm, if there are male embryos, they, they could be juxtaposed to the worms that we were picking and doing the analysis on. It's great. Thank you. Um, we censor bags and we censor gut extrusion, extrusions, although we've had endless conversations about that. But are they included up to the point of that? Yes. Are they uh, no, they're, they're censored. They're censored classically, so they're included up to the point. Which they, they disappear. So I think what she's after is, is that just because of um, No, we, we, we had long discussions about these strains are, wild strains are pretty aggressive and sometimes bury into the agar. And we were worried about that and whether we should be censoring any worm that is ever seen off the, off the top of the agar. And that's essentially what we're doing at the moment. We're, we're trashing experiments where they bury. We've, we've upped the agar concentration for all the strains to stop that from happening or reduce it. Um, okay, this is supposed to be about testing compounds. Unfortunately, we've got some data to show you on that issue. Despite all this variance that's going on in the background, I, did, I should have said that, you know, in the original data set, the biggest variance is run to run. And that, that applies to both elegans and tropicalis as well. You set up the experiment and you set it up again and you get a different answer. The run-to-run -run variation is huge compared to the lab-to-lab -lab variation or even the species-to-species the -species variation. Okay. So um, at some point, we're going to invite the community to suggest compounds for the program, just as the ITP did. In the first phase, the NIA actually suggested that we just uh, test some compounds that have already been tested in mouse models or compounds that have been published to extend lifespan in C. elegans. So essentially getting at the robustness issue right away. Um, these are the ones we picked uh, for multiple reasons. Uh, we felt that we could handle them easily. They were interesting to the community, like resveratrol, or we felt that they were likely to work. And thioflavin T, the amyloid binding compound we mentioned earlier, was one of those that we thought, this always looks fairly good in our hands. So 
Sorry if your favourite compound isn't up there, but maybe you could suggest it and we'll get it enrolled in the future iterations. Well, it's not cutting in. So that now no? right. Yeah. Right. I mean, yeah, and, and we, we do not address mechanism at all so far in this study. We don't do it. We've done no assays at all to address mechanism. But, I mean, we were worried about, yeah, okay, I won't go into it. Uh, I'll, I'll just show you, I'll show you what we saw. Um, very, very complicated slide, but there's, there's reasons for that. Um, so the panel on the left, I'll, I'll show you this, then come back to it. The panel on the left is the absolute lifespans for, and we had to choose a limited number of strains. So we went with six strains, two from each species to begin with. So maybe it really is too small to see, but each panel is a different compound. And then there's the strains, and so for pair, pair comparisons, you go from here to here. I wanted to show you the absolute lifespan so you can see the diversity of these strains. You have short-lived strains and really quite long-lived strains. This is an easier way to look at the data somewhat misleading in other ways, but it's, it's a way to look at it. So the line here, the line where? Yes. There's supposed to be a dotted line going all the way across there. For some reason, it's faded out of this one. That line are the control plates. Control plates that you're looking at at the same time as you're looking at your drug plates. And the deviation from the line is the percentage increase away from control. So this is a big lifespan increase here. And um, I'll go to the next slide and then come back and show you some other features. So what is the the Tropicalis. Oh, but Tropicalis is not on here. Sorry. This is, this is, this is the three. The, so these are three different strains of C. elegans and three different strains of Briggsy. Sorry, I didn't. I, I misled you there. So two species in this data set. Here's a close-up of some things that are going on. So thio-T, um, in some strains, like this strain MY16, really, really good. Here's the strain that we, we discovered it in, and uh, you know, occasionally, at our lab, we'll see not an effect at all. Um, but for the most part, it behaved pretty well across the labs, and we got a significant increase. However, in this strain, the increase is much, much larger. So we're already seeing gene by compound treatment interaction. These strains are, are doing something different. And then, Another C. elegans strain, pretty good. Again, Lithgow Lab somehow with our own compound it's dropping out. And then the Briggs E strains, well, actually, a, a decent spread here, all significant, um, but you just on the whole, it looks as if there's less effect than in elegans. Here's a nice example. Um, three labs again, this is a, a compound called MP1, it's a caloric restriction mimetic that came out of a compound screen that we performed. And uh, all three labs in the strain it was discovered are seeing lifespan extension. That's great. But now if we go to HK104, one of the Briggs EA strains out here, you'll see that actually in all three labs it's shortening lifespan. So again, we might have expected to see this, that some compounds will extend lifespan in some strains, but shorten it in a different genetic background. And this could be a dosing issue, a toxicity issue, and we're thinking about all the ways that we can, we can test that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I... In, I mean, in some cases, we can think of experiments to do. I mean, obviously, if we reduce the dose and it starts to creep up here, it's probably a pharmacokinetic issue, that these worms are taking more of it in, uh, not metabolizing it as fast, it becomes toxic, and that shortens lifespan. But we, we can do that. I think there'll be more interesting things as well, though, where the target is modified, and uh, that this may lead to some new biology. Yeah, within, yes, and, and there's a potential to do it between how some. Do you have one? Like, how, how much is it? How much is the diversity? It's allelic variation in the... the oh, I, you know, I wish Patrick was here to answer that. Um, it, I mean, it's huge between HK104 and N2. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's very large between these strains. And is uh, it similar between the C. elegans and the Yes. Because there could be more, right? There could be more diversity. So, so, so it'd be 
like more um, outbred as, as opposed to like the island race, right? Yes. And so it might be just the elegance is kind of. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know. Yeah, all of this is possible. I mean, the gen genetic architecture behind this is definitely up for investigation. And, and no one, I mean, the, the, these are, the, all the genomes are sequenced. Yeah. But what's, yeah, connecting it to the phenotype. Right. Yeah. I think we actually use that phrase in the paper. Yes. Um, it's a great question. They're, they're, um, this is the longest lived strain in the bucket, and so there, I think there's a trend towards that, but there's examples that kick, the, kick that away. Um, the, the big effects, in fact, that's really why I showed this data in a previous form. Um, some of the biggest effects in, let's see, oh, see all the guns, NY16 here, so this is giving a really big effect, but actually it's not much longer lived than the strain that's not giving a big effect. So it'll, this will evolve as we keep doing these things. Um, Thio T and P1. Okay, well, let me just briefly bring you back to this, to sh point to some other things. First of all, resveratrol does pretty well in elegance. It's never huge. It's actually highly consistent with the, the, if you take all the resveratrol data from all the different labs that have looked at it, they generally see a small but significant increase in lifespan. And we're seeing that for elegans as well. alpha ketoglutarate um, behaves very well, and you can start to see that there are similar patterns between some of these compounds. So thioflavin T, alpha ketoglutarate, and even MP1, to, uh, it's not quite as nice as it used to look, um, but we're wondering if common pattern means common mechanism. Is there, is there something there that the response to the strains is telling you something about mechanism? Don't know. Um, some other things. We published a few years ago that alpha lipoic acid extends lifespan. This data suggests that that is not a robust finding. Neither is curcumin, which looked really nice in our 2011 nature paper, always worked in our hands. Well, now it hasn't passed this particular test. One other feature I want to show you, and it's really obvious, it's less obvious when you look at this, the data presented like this, but it's really obvious if you look at these. One of the stunning things that we see is a huge unpredictability sometimes. There's really a large spread. I mean, there's, there's lots of examples where you set up the experiment and you got a 40% increase in lifespan. And you set it up again, you got a 40% reduction in lifespan. And that is all over the shop. So, so in contrast to some of these compounds that appear to be behaving in the sense that they are fairly reproducible from lab to lab, there are compounds that are going all over the place in different genetic backgrounds. They're hyper-variable. And it, again, it suggests that the variance in these experiments is, is probably larger than we ever really appreciated. And like most labs, we would set up an experiment with a compound, we'd do it three times, we'd see an effect, and we'd publish it. And we were probably not ever sampling the total variance for the interaction of that compound with a particular genetic background. And so along comes somebody else, and they do the three experiments, and they publish the other end of the variance, and they say your compounds don't work. I don't know if that contributes to what we've seen in the literature, but that's the kind of things that we're thinking about right now. Especially when we see the sort of hyper-variability responses to certain compounds, you think there's stuff going on that we don't know about, and without doing things to scale, you might never see. So we're big fans of the ITP, and we, we think that hopefully this will also come along and say, you know, we, this is a way to do things where you really can nail down. And it's not that one lab knows what it's doing and another lab doesn't know what it's doing. It's just that we haven't really sampled the variants. So, finish up by saying that we are seeing clear gene by compound effects, the nature of which we don't know yet. We do see robust lifespan extension for some compounds. If, if this all looked like propogallate, we would be in a mess right, right now. <laughs> this would have been an absolute disaster. Um, but it's interesting that we see n not only no potentially novel sources of variation, like the Briggs-A biphasic thing that's going on, 
but also hypervariance in response to compounds, highly unpredictable responses. So I will leave it by saying that this was all done manually by a very large number of people, um, each contributing you know, a few hours a week or a couple of days a week. Um, and as a result, we've had a long conversation in the CITP about how we could automate things. Um, we decided to adopt a technology that came out of another lab um, make some adaptions, and now we have, this is now 40, we have 40 so-called lifespan machines. So these are, these are high-end document scanners, Epson, made by Epson, and we modify them, mo modify the focal plane, modify the temperature conditions, put fans on them, and then we put a bunch of agar plates in there you they traditionally do the experiments on. And then the scanner takes a picture of all those plates, now it takes another picture 20 minutes later. And it, the, the computation compares the images and asks if things that look like worms in those images have moved or not. And if they've moved, they're alive. And so we set up these machines, we walk out the room, and we come back 30, 40 days later when the experiment's concluded. And there's data processing that has to go on after that that's still time consuming, but essentially no one's touching the worms during the survival analysis. We don't know what this is going to do to the compound work because with compounds you're generally moving the worms onto new plates every three or four days and it could really change everything. But we do think that it's potentially a way to go to optimize doses for things, to have a first look at a whole bunch of new compounds that people are suggesting and potentially eventually could take over from people sitting at microscopes and doing this highly labor intensive stuff and free them up to do more interesting things. Um, I, oh, and I should say that, yeah, I should just briefly say that the same setup has now been established at all three sites. So we invested something like $200,000 at each site to, to set up the system. Randy. To a certain extent, we tried to avoid it by, um, with all the lifespan experiments, you set up replicate plates, and each replicate would go to a different investigator. And then you, you could go back to that data set and say, well, is this investigator, you know, always getting short-lived worms? And, and that, that doesn't, it happened in one case. It was amazing. We came back, we said, this, this person here in Monica's lab is getting lifespans that are two or three days shorter than everyone else. It turned out it was someone who had just come into lab they were doing lifespans for the first time, and it was, it was clear that this was a lack of experience in handling the worms. But, but generally, we're trying to avoid that kind of investigator bias just by distributing plates. But you're right. I mean, we don't know. I mean, I, you know, we take people into this room all the time to show them these great lifespan machines, and any given person could be influenced in the experiment. We've talked about the, the, the dander experiments and the t-shirt experiments, and you know, should we somehow try and control for them? We, we will be doing that, absolutely. Um, it's, it's a high priority, and uh, we just don't have enough data from the machines yet to know. We've, we've got enough to suggest that they're fairly similar. We've looked at a bunch of wild strains um, against, against manual assays, and it's, it's a very good correlation and fairly similar. So, but now we can get into these more interesting things. Yeah? So it's 30 worms per plate. There's no transfers. Um, if a plate goes down to contamination, we, 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 there's nothing we can do. But what about running out of food? We don't run out of food. There's, there's enough food on there. I mean, obviously, we've had to optimize to a certain extent. The plates are, are we use a, a modified plate. It's sealed completely. So there's no evaporation. Um, and so the amount of agar you put in there is the amount you get at the end. Um, but in terms of food, there's just enough food in there. Oh, and we're using sterile worms, of course. We're not, there's no progeny production in the plates. It's all, yeah. yeah, and so you, they, don't, they just don't run out of food. Uh, why do you say heat shot? Oh, 
Yes, they're, they're, they've grown at 25. We, we also do FUDR. Obviously, we have to do FUDR for all the wild strains that we're going to use in this system. So the initial experiments were done with sterile 1060s with different, a couple of different compounds, and now it's, everything's FUDR in the manuals as well. So that's a major limitation. FUDR, we and other people have published effect, you know, protein homeostasis and other things. Um, but there was, we considered that there was really no other way to do it with the wild strains. We, we don't have sterile mutants for the wild strains. In, in these machines, it's a huge issue. I mean, what, we're, what we do is that because we're capturing all these images, we can go back and look. Um, the system, uh, as it came out of the Fontana lab, the software that they designed allows you to look at little movies of the last few hours of a worm's life. So if a worm is appearing around the same coordinates, you can go in and, and look at how it died. And that can reveal that, you know, that there was an extrusion for, for example, still difficult to see, I would say. Um, but so then we censored there. Um, we can, it's easy to censor lost. The censoring's not automated. There's a, there's a manual component to the data analysis still. We're thinking of ways, how can we get rid of this? But obviously missing worms are, are censored and that's much easier because you've got a total number of worms each day. To a certain extent, so we're, we're wondering how we can modify that. Um, it's, it's essentially now making a call between there or not there, or in the close vicinity of. And so once it gets down to those last uh, few hours of life, yes, you're capturing movement data there, but it, it doesn't capture prior movement data. So we're, we're thinking, is there a modification? But we already use other software and systems for movement that's automated that seems to be working quite well anyway. So there's... It'd be nice to have the data come out of the system, but I don't think we need it right now. Yes, absolutely, that's right. Yeah, you could do individuals. Yeah. Yes, I mean, for most of these compounds, people have looked at feeding behaviors in prior studies. Um, MP1, for example, it's a caloric restriction mimetic. It does affect feeding behavior, but we actually think it's targeting appetite as opposed to just feeding. So, so there, is, there is some knowledge for, for, for some of the, most of these compounds, I would say. It's certainly true that, you know, as the community suggests things to us, and especially when they suggest novel compounds, one of the first things we'll have to think about is this simply a, a redu reduction in feeding. And it's not that easy to really sort out definitively in the world. Oh. You uh, handle uh, chemical differences chemical stability between different drugs. <sighs> we don't. <laughs> we don't. We are still very much at a stage of following either a published concentration protocol uh, and, and following our own protocol. And we have no information about the stability of the drug in the agar. We have no information about the stability or turnover or metabolism of the drug in the worm. And uh, I guess we rely on people like Shane to work some of that stuff out for us. Um, I, I don't know if that'll change, if we'll have to think of other ways in which, you know, we, we measure these things. Uh, most things we could potentially get a mass spec assay for and make some measurements. I just want to thank the people in the lab that were involved in the vitamin D story, which was mainly um, uh, Ida and Carla especially, and uh, Deepa. And I also want to put up all the names of all the people who took part in those manual CITP assays and our collaborators and funding. I'm happy to take more questions, obviously. Yeah. Ah, yes. We, we, we imagine that we might find a common signature molecular signature, structural signature for the proteins that become insoluble or the amyloid-like, you know, the chances of forming beta sheets. We were never able to do that. I mean, we're relying on other people's expertise. Um, and we, we, we haven't found any bioinformatic or structural signature to those proteins. I mean, there's, there's, they're abundant. They're, for the most part, abundant proteins. They're not all abundant. 
Um, and we imagine that there's a bias there. You make a protein extract, you, you purify a small amount, a small fraction, you're going to get abundant proteins. But there's also non-abundant proteins in there. Um, we've looked at disorganized domains. We've looked for many features, but haven't seen anything. Um, I'd love to send people lists of proteins that, you know, if they thought that we could find something, it'd be great. Yeah, you want to follow up? Yes. The reason I'm asking is that so you show that uh, you know when you did the experiment you say that on A, you suppress any of the proteins you get like part of yeah. the patient. So I don't know what could be that rationale because those proteins may not be play very important role. Yeah, I, I, you know, it was it was a surprise. Now, first of all, RNAi is a partial knockdown for the most part, so you're not you're not it's nothing like a knockout. Many of those proteins, I think, would be absolutely lethal as knockouts. Um, but we, for some reason, we saw very few when we RNAi that really shortened lifespan dramatically. What, I mean, really, one or two out of the hundred that we looked at. So it, it's surprising. I, I, there, I mean, there's there's been some additional papers from other labs and looking at when proteins are synthesized and the abundance of proteins. It may be that, that these proteins are absolutely required in early, for development and fertility, and then maybe some of them that appears this is true, they creep up in abundance in late life, and maybe that's when the problem occurs. And so if you can keep them at a lower level in late life, you see benefits, but it's all conjecture. Yeah? In, in those experiments that initially showed the life the CIC, did you post more than finding that? Oh, yeah, actually. Yeah, no. There's one I really want to mention. I forgot. So we we found that valproic acid shortens lifespan in all strains and all labs, and that was very surprising because I'm a huge fan of uh, Kerry Kornfeld's original paper on val valproic acid. It was really carefully done. We felt like there's lots of replicates in there. It just does great stuff. So it was surprising, and and you know immediately you know, thought, what are we going to write about this? Kerry actually is on our steering committee, so we were going to present this data to Kerry and. Um, and he's such a nice guy, but but you know we thought well let's let's at least think about some explanations, and so we go back to Kerry's paper, and it turns out that almost every experiment in that paper, Kerry was treating his his worms for two generations before doing the experiment, and we weren't we were taking adult worms and putting them onto the compound, and then valproic acid involved in histone deacetylation maybe what Kerry's looking at is a multi generational effect or certainly an epigenetic effect, something might happen during development, and we would miss that completely. So I think that's a really good example. You know, again, you could go out there and say, that lab doesn't know what we're doing, we've got the definitive answer across three labs. I think that's wrong. I think all labs know what they're doing, they're just using different methods, and it points to the importance of actually trying to replicate the experiment. Absolutely, yeah. I, 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 I agree. I mean, I think that it, it's too easy to think that there's something wrong in that lab. That's, it's the easy conclusion to jump to, and instead thinking, what are we doing different? And, and this phenotype of lifespan is so exquisitely sensitive and so hyper-variable in some circumstances that we should err on the side of caution and say, chances are this does work under certain circumstances. We just need to find out what it is. Uh, I mean, it's actually made us think about the phenotype itself and whether it's necessarily the best phenotype to draw, you know, to to proceed. I mean, maybe we should be looking at other health span measures. You've been talking about this for years, Al. I mean, that, that maybe are just better things that we should be doing, even in the worm, that a are going to be more robust, um, and less variable, and b actually maybe relate to features of mammalian aging that clinicians would be more interested in. And we're, we're talking a lot about that. What features can we be thinking about and looking at that could be better measures? And maybe maybe lifespan takes a back seat eventually. I don't know. Yeah. When you use the term hypervariable yeah. a number of times, and um, I think the, I'm going to hypothesize that the jury is still out on really how hypervariable lifespan is. Variable. I mean, it still remains to be shown whether or not all these issues in the literature where they say they can't replicate this or that or another thing. It's never been looked at to this degree of, uh, of, of, of depth. Yes. 
Yes, I agree. I agree. I mean, one, one thing that struck us was, um, maybe this is a silly example, but when we look at development times, the variability around development times across all these strains is so small in comparison to lifespan. And, um, you know, we might want to suggest that, you know, development is under the, you know, the, the lens of natural selection. There's all selective forces around development time that do just simply don't exist for lifespan. And so, um, you know, it's our gold, it's still a gold standard, in, even in C. elegans, for, for aging phenotypes is, is the lifespan. But, but we are choosing to look at a phenotype that is much more variable than others. Now, I don't know if there's something in between that we can, we can think about that might be narrower. But I agree. Shane? Oh, I thought, I think Al was just pressing the button there, wasn't it? <laughs> we have to do emails, that's right. <laughs> mm. um, we're, we're essentially doing survival analysis, Kaplan Meyer survival analysis. So there's a lot more that we can do. Mortality trajectories are really interesting. With, I think they're going to be interesting. You know, with some compounds, they're lowering age-specific mortality, and others are changing the slope of the line. All sorts of interesting things going on. I think it's interesting. We'll see. Yeah, that's right. So you know, as Pam said, we, we can test in males and see if there's a sex-specific effect in in the, in the nematodes as well. Um, yeah, you know. It, NIA is influential in this, and I, I think they would like to see an overall assessment of the correlation between what's the results coming out of Cinerabditis and the ITP. I think that's a fair enough question to ask. I mean, if, if we do not see any correlation, it's going to suggest that maybe we're not looking at the same thing, and we just have to accept that. So in our next list of 10 compounds, there's probably like six or seven that are ITP compounds. Rapamycin is difficult to work with in worms. It's, it's very close to the solubility limit, um, where you begin to see an effect. So not a lot of people are really doing anything with it. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Um, there's there's actually efforts to engineer worms that don't metabolize drugs as, as well and take up more compound to begin with. Jennifer Garrison, junior faculty at the Buck, has, has various strains of worms now that it would be worth testing these things in. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that, this is going to be the bane of our lives for the next few years. But basically, uh, the, the closest homologue to human vitamin D receptor is a gene called DAF12, as you know, and have worked on. Um, we've looked at DAF12. There's no DAF12 dependency. We've looked at DAF. We expressed DAF12 in mammalian cells, and come on with with vitamin D, and there's no effect. And Matt Gill also looked at this a few years ago. So. We definitely could be missing something about DAF12, but there's no evidence that it's DAF12. So we've done some screens. So we've done screens on the nuclear hormone receptors, RNAi screens, on the paralysis phenotypes, tested them on lifespans, and we've got a problem. We have groups of nuclear hormone receptors that are required for the phenotypes, but they're not all required for any given... Sorry, they're not all... There is no one receptor required for all the phenotypes. So either we're facing a situation where there are multiple receptors. It's possible this family's expanded so much in the worm. There could be different receptors uh, uh, you know, signaling to different phenotypes. It's just not a very satisfactory result. And so we're thinking about biochemical ways to go after the best receptor. And probably we'll never be able to publish until we find it. <laughs> Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you.